On today's Winning Cures Everything, we got a preview week four. We got a lot of monster matchups. We're going to talk about what's going on in Alabama. We're going to talk Colorado TV ratings. Uh, I've got the most unlikely wins from week three. And, uh, and we're going to do a couple of early game previews. We're going to talk uh, what my picks would be on these games. But let's go on and start it. Can you believe it? It's football. I've been watching it for 40 years. Are you kidding me? You're listening to Winning Cures Everything. Game day, baby. Wake up or get out. Here's your host. A confident young man. A superb athlete. Gary Seegers. All right, welcome in. It is the Tuesday, September 19th edition of the show, Winning Cures Everything. I'm your host, Gary Seegers. You can follow me on Instagram and TikTok, at GaryWCE. Whew, fellas, uh, it's been a wild one, a wild one. As you can see, I am back in the office for right now. My mother-in-law is uh, is holed up, working from home at my home, in my studio, in my man cave. So, had to come up to uh, to the office to knock out a couple of things, and we are knocking this one out. Now, this is going to be a pretty short show, uh, but we got a lot to dive into. First off, Bet US College Football Show every Tuesday and Wednesday, 1 p.m. Eastern Time. Make sure that you are subscribed there. There is a link in the description for that. Along with that, check out Three Dog Thursday. Uh, I'm probably not going to be on that for a little bit, but TJ and whoever else he has, they are going to have it on this channel. So go ahead and be ready for that one. Um, also, buymeacoffee.com slash winning cures. I'll be posting up stat sheets and whatnot over there if you want to see them, if you feel like donating, all that good stuff. Uh, and then, of course, Telegram, if you want to follow me, t.me slash GaryWCE. Uh, I give out all of my plays from every week over there, tell you what I like, what I don't like, all that good stuff. Any kind of, you know, breaking news that I come across, I will, uh, I'll post it over there and make sure that you guys see it. So... Follow me on Telegram, Gary WCE. All right. Enough about that. Let's start with this. Jalen Milrow is going to be the starter for Alabama this week against Ole Miss. Uh, what happened? He didn't even play in week three. Now, Greg McElroy has come out and said that basically Milroy, Milroy, Milrow did not do a very good job of handling the fact that the other quarterbacks were uh, getting as many reps as him last week, so this was basically a suspension. I think Nick Saban thought we can win this game with me at quarterback, so let's see what we got with these other two guys, and if we need to, we'll go back to Jalen Milrow, but uh, apparently he did, and this goes back to 2011, I believe it is, when A.J. McCarron came in as a true freshman, and he was he came into the coach's office after practice and was livid that he was running with the threes. And he, he said, "There's I am absolutely the best quarterback on this team. Why am I running with threes? And Nick Saban told him, well, this was a test in leadership, and you failed miserably. Now, A.J. picked up better after that. But uh, this was one of those spots where Jalen Milrow didn't do the things he needed to do against Texas. And some of that might have been on the coaching staff for not putting him in the right position. But who knows? But Milrow is now going to be starting... Does that mean he's going to start the rest of the year? Who knows? Right? This is this Alabama situation is insane. Absolutely insane. But Milrow is going to be your guy against Ole Miss this weekend, and we'll see what kind of offense they put him in. So long as you put your guys in a position to succeed and don't ask them to do things that they can't do, uh, you tend to have pretty good results. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, Lane Kiffin. Lane Kiffin came out and told the media that they believe that Tavares Robinson, Alabama's cornerbacks coach, is calling the plays for the defense. He said he saw some things on the TV tape that they got for the US, uh, USF game. USF, US, yeah, South Florida game. How's that? And they believe that schematically things have changed and that Kevin Steele is not the defensive coordinator anymore. This is a mind game ploy. However, he may not be entirely wrong about that, uh, I think that after the Texas game, they were trying to shore up the way that they get certain plays in and how quickly they can do it, especially against an Alex Golesh defense, right? That's a, a big part of this. You know how quick Alex Golesh ran his offense at Tennessee and how quick he wants to do it at USF. 
So you got to get your plays in quicker. And to do that, Robinson had to get them in from the sideline because Kevin Steele is in the box. So I think Kevin Steele is still the defensive coordinator, but they might have changed up uh, some of the things that they do for that one game, or it could be for the rest of the season. I mean, who knows? Who knows? There's a lot of different things that could be going on here, but one thing it did do is it forced Nick Saban to talk about it at his next press conference. This is mind games. This is Lane Kiffin playing mind games. Uh, but you don't normally hear coaches talk about this kind of thing publicly. They're all tied in. They all know each other. They all talk. So when you get some kind of tidbit like this, you don't normally see it publicized. You don't see them take it out to a press conference. But that's Lane. I think he feels like he's got something this weekend. I think he thinks that they can beat Alabama this weekend. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. Uh, Next up and last little news nugget of the day, Colorado's TV ratings for ESPN on Saturday night. And don't get me wrong. They had Lil Wayne and they had The Rock and they had... Uh, ESPN primetime, which was 9 p.m. Central, 10 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, It did 9.3 million viewers on average. It peaked at over 11 million viewers at well past midnight Eastern. I mean, it was was almost 1 o'clock in the morning when they peaked on this thing. I've never heard of football numbers like this, college football numbers like this, especially not for a late night window. That is absolutely insane. Like, you've had really, really good match. And the fact that this one went to overtime and whatnot, obviously, that's huge. But this is, I mean, you've got boxing pay-per-views and UFC pay-per-views and whatnot that, that haven't hit this number. Like, this is, that late night slot is not supposed to do this. But, man, they made it a show. And you want to talk about the new viewership that is coming in because of Deion Sanders. It is wild. Absolutely Wild. So, and if you are a longtime college football fan and you don't like all these new guys coming in, uh, talking about stuff that they don't know about, um, it is, it's awesome. I mean, it's this is great because you want more people watching the sport, and they are absolutely watching Deion Sanders, absolutely, uh, and they put on a show every single week. It's it's always something. So this was, this was crazy, but a nine point three million viewers. Uh, and it peaked at over 11 million. ESPN's fifth most watched college football game of all time. It drew more viewers than Alabama and Texas. Just wild. Just wild. Now, part of this is the fact that there was not exactly a lot going on elsewhere, so the entire college football universe got to focus in on it. Uh, But it seems like the TV guys are, are doing their job. Both Big Noon and College Game Day went to Boulder last week, uh, because there wasn't a bigger game, and it turned into an absolute spectacle. So cheers to that. Uh, I can't wait to see what the ABC number is going to be for Colorado and Oregon this week. This is the first time we've seen Colorado going against the name brand. So how many more viewers can can Oregon bring in? Going to be something. Going to be something. All right. We ask this question every week. Where is college game day going for week number five? Now, obviously, a lot of this hinges on what happens in week four, and we've got some monster matchups this week. Game day headed to South Bend this weekend for Ohio State and Notre Dame, and that makes sense because it's it's two massive brands in this sport, uh, same as when you had Texas and Alabama. So, But I think that week five, even if we don't get a Notre Dame win, I think Duke is going to take care of business. I think they're going to head to Notre Dame at Duke in Durham. I think that the Blue Devils are going to finally get to host college game day. And there's a lot of other options here. Obviously, if Ole Miss gets a win over Alabama and LSU handles their business, LSU at Ole Miss could be a lot of fun because obviously the guys in game day love going to the Grove. We know that. Uh, Georgia at Auburn. If Auburn finds a way to beat A&M, well, then you've got a top 25 matchup on the Plains. That could be a lot of fun. USC at Colorado, well, that's proven to be a ratings bonanza. Uh, That's going to be an early game, but, I mean, I don't think you can do wrong. Even if Colorado gets beat up this weekend at Oregon, I think you still could bring the Heisman Trophy winner in there against Deion Sanders, and it would do massive numbers for game day. 
Uh, Clemson at Syracuse could be interesting, right? Clemson beats Florida State. Syracuse keeps their thing rolling against Army. We'll see. They've never been to Syracuse. They've never been to Duke. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, and then Kansas at Texas is another option. Just something to kind of, you know, put a pencil or put a pen in it, you know, whatever. Write it down in pencil. Uh, just an idea. Kansas at Texas. You could have two undefeated teams. Uh, last time Kansas went in there, they won the game. Kansas now could be undefeated going into Austin. So, all right. Let's move into our college football week four preview. And this is where I ask a lot of questions and I try and give you some answers and and whatnot. We'll start off with this one. The biggest brand games. Who is going to get the highest ratings this weekend? Now, I initially thought Notre Dame and Ohio State was going to get the highest ratings. And I still think that's probably the case. But I think Colorado and Oregon may be... I mean, it may be close. It may be really, really close. But Notre Dame and Ohio State, that one's going to be on NBC. Um, it's in South Bend. All the tradition, all the pageantry, all the you, you get it. Uh, Ole Miss and Alabama, people flock to see when Alabama's going to lose a ball game. If this one's tight, especially towards the end, I think you're going to see a lot of viewers on CBS. Uh, CBS, the easy, easiest picked up channel on television. Because any TV antenna can pick that thing up. So, and it's kind of the same with Fox and whatnot, but it, it, CBS tends to be the easier one. Uh, Colorado and Oregon, I, there is a chance that, that one does just monster numbers. If that ends up being somewhat close, especially in the fourth quarter, uh, that could be huge numbers. And then on ABC, Florida State at Clemson, um, yeah, like, okay, probably took a little bit of the shine off of it that Clemson lost in week one. But, eh, I mean, that's still a monster game. It could be a changing of the guard in the ACC. So, something to pay attention to. The most exciting games on the schedule for this week. What, what games are going to be the closest? I already mentioned Notre Dame, Ohio State. I already said Ole Miss and Alabama. Uh, I already said Florida State and Clemson. Going to toss out a couple more. Utah and UCLA. I think that could be a... Monster game. Utah is hosting UCLA in a Rice Eccles Stadium. So they don't typically lose there, but potentially Cam Rising coming back. UCLA has looked really, really good. And of course, uh, freshman quarterback Dante Moore looks fantastic in that offense. Uh, that is, that's going to be a hard nosed game, low scoring, I would imagine. Uh, something to pay attention to. Uh, Oregon State going to the Palouse. They are taking on Washington State. I think that one is going to be really, really close. Uh, most people would just blindly take Oregon State, kind of like Washington State there. We'll talk about that in the in the breakdowns uh, later on this week. But either way. And, uh, and another exciting game to pay attention to, this is a G5 game. So just it's something to have on somewhere else. Western Kentucky at Troy. This was tight last year. I expect it to be tight this year. Uh, Troy, not quite the same team that they were last season. Uh, got beat last week by James Madison, 16-14. to uh, Kind of expect a similar kind of game. Uh, more points, definitely. But that's uh, something to pay attention to. So, Western Kentucky and Troy, one of the most exciting games. Now, who's got the most to gain and who's got the most to lose this weekend? Ohio State is the first one to me. I think they got the most to gain and the most to lose. This weekend, they're favored on the road in South Bend. Seems like they got things uh, headed in the right direction against Western Kentucky last week. They got the passing game kind of going, put up 63 points. Notre Dame's defense, not going to be as easy to carve up as Western Kentucky's was. But uh, you lose this one, and you can't lose another one and still make the playoff, we think. right? We've never had a two-loss team make the playoff, but regardless... Uh, you got a lot going on here. So, uh, Ohio State, I mean, that's it. you You can prove wrong a lot of doubters this weekend against Notre Dame. Uh, UCLA, most to gain this weekend at Utah. Now, obviously, Cam Rising has not played yet this year. Um, if he comes back and looks fantastic, well, okay. But UCLA's schedule, if you look after this game, uh, it is, I mean, a whole lot of nothing. I mean, UCLA's schedule is just bleh after this. So if they can get this win, then they will, I mean, 
they'll just keep on rolling. I mean, it's it's wild. Uh, UCLA's football schedule is, well, how interesting. It didn't pull up what I wanted it to pull up. Let's see, 2023 football schedule. Okay. So, after this, they've got Washington State, and then they got Oregon State. Well, okay, so that's a little more difficult than I anticipated. <laughs> Let's see. They've got Utah this week. Then they go, they have a bye week, and then they host Washington State. They play at Oregon State. They've got Stanford. They've got Colorado. They've got Arizona, Arizona State, and then USC and Cal to close things out. If you can get a win at Utah, it sets up pretty well for UCLA to be able to win the Pac 12. So uh, most to gain is UCLA here. Uh, Most to lose, Clemson. You could take a second ACC loss by week four of the season if you lose to Florida State. I I don't remember the last time that's happened. I mean, it it had to be early, early in Dabo's tenure. Um, But that could be, I mean, they could be knocked out of the ACC race before September's done. That's crazy. So, uh, definitely most to lose there. And then Alabama against Ole Miss. For Alabama, every year it is national championship or bust. You've already got one loss. Now you are at home. Uh, Nick Saban has now lost three times in the last two years to former assistants, Jimbo, Kirby Smart, and Steve Sarkeesian. Used to be something that never, never, never happened. Uh, He could lose to two of them in the same weekend here (laughs) with defensive coordinator Pete Golding and head coach Lane Kiffin with Ole Miss. Uh, but you want to get the SEC slate off on the right foot. So Alabama, it would be wise to win this game this weekend. Most likely underdog outright winners. I think UCLA can win at Utah. They're four and a half point dogs right now. I think they can win outright. So I would take UCLA there. BYU and Kansas. BYU is now like a nine point dog at Kansas. What am I missing? My numbers have BYU favored by a point. Why is this moving in the opposite direction? Uh, It doesn't make any sense to me. But obviously, we'll see. There are sharper guys than me out there. But but I think BYU, worth a money line sprinkle. Washington State, at home against Oregon State. They are two and a half point dogs. It's like plus 120, something like that, plus 125. Um, That one, I think, can win. And then Thursday night, we're going to talk about this game in just a minute. Georgia State against Coastal Carolina. Georgia State is plus six and a half or plus six at some places. Um, you can get them at like plus 240 on the money line somewhere on there. Uh, yeah, that's worth a play because I don't think Coastal Carolina is very good this year. So we shall see what happens there. And I like to close up these previews with the G5 game of the week. And I've got four options this week. Western Kentucky at Troy, I think could be really, really good. I think that's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, good coaching matchup, etc. Colorado State heads to Middle Tennessee. That's right. After they go to Boulder and have to face Deion Sanders and all that, they get to head to Murfreesboro and take on Rick Stockstill. Yeah, that one's going to be interesting. So, uh, James Madison at Utah State. Now, Utah State took it on the chin against uh, Air Force last week. James Madison, I think, is a really good, well-coached team. Utah State is chaotic. If they can create enough chaos, they can win the game. Uh, But I do kind of like James Madison there. I think that could be a fun game. And then finally on Friday night, uh, Boise State and San Diego State. Uh, This one is, I mean, it's these are two guys that are just going to toss a bunch of oranges into some socks and beat each other with them. Like that's that's what's going to happen in this game. Uh, Neither has a good offense. Uh, Something to watch on Friday night for sure. That one's going to be the late game, 10.30 p.m. Eastern time. 9.30 9.30 p.m. Central, God's time zone, uh, on Friday night on CBS Sports Network. So, that will conclude the week four preview. Um, now, let's do our viewing guide for week number four. And uh, and let's see. Let's see what we got. I'm going to go and pull it up on our screen. Actually, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to uh, run an ad right quick. And then we'll come back with our viewing guide. Let's check out some things you should know about. Every Tuesday and Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern, expert game analysis only on the BetUS TV College football channel. 
If you haven't already, subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or whatever's your favorite podcast app. And if your app allows it, leave a five-star written review. Visit the Winning Cures Everything web store to get all kinds of football shirts, hats, hoodies, mugs, and more. Visit winningcureseverything.com slash store to see what all we've added. And now, back to the show. All right. College football viewing guide for week number four. And boy, do we have quite a bit going on here. And so let's go on and pull it up on your screen. Yeah, let's let's do this. Let's do it where you can see the whole page. We'll start on Thursday night, 7.30 p.m. Eastern. Uh, no, I guess Central on ESPN. And we have got... Eh, this is not... Central, this is Eastern. Okay, well, it's 6.30 p.m. Central time. Georgia State at Coastal Carolina. That's the only game on, so obviously we're going to be watching that one. Uh, on Friday night, I want to see Wisconsin and Purdue. That's what I'm looking forward to the most uh, on Friday is that one right there. And so Wisconsin and Purdue. Then, of course, you got the late, uh, late night slate. Um, I'm going to be watching Boise and San Diego State, but that's because I've got to play on that one. Uh, although I think Air Force and San Jose State could be the more interesting matchup. All right, we move into Saturday, and boy, do we have some big ones going on here. Boy, do we have some big ones. All right, so the noon slate. My main TV is going to have Florida State at Clemson up there on ABC. That one's at 11 a.m. Central Time, God's Time Zone. Uh, but on the other two TVs, I'm probably going to have Western Kentucky at Troy. And I'm going to have Auburn at Texas A&M. I want to see what Hugh Freeze does with Jimbo Fisher on ESPN over there. Uh, but you got some other ones. Rutgers in Michigan should be, you know, Jim Harbaugh's return. We'll see. Army Syracuse, uh, that's got some intrigue. Kentucky and Vanderbilt. Uh, A.J. Swan got banged up against UNLV. So what is that going to look like? SMU TCU, this will be the last meeting between these two for uh, for a little while. Uh, and then you got Virginia Tech, Marshall, Grant Wells, or the Grant Wells Bowl, I guess, because he transferred from Marshall over to Virginia Tech. And, um, yeah, Virginia Tech, uh, not good. Really not good. Marshall is favored by 7.5 here, and I think it should be more. Uh, Oklahoma is favored by 15 over Cincinnati. That one's uh, the big noon kick on Fox. Uh, Cincinnati lost to Miami of Ohio last week. Oklahoma is now favored by 15 in that spot. So, yeah. Uh, let's see. The Saturday, 2.30 p.m. Central Time slot. I am going to have my TV on Ole Miss and Alabama. Now, at the same time, you got some pretty big Pac-12 games. So I am going to have Colorado and Oregon on one screen and UCLA-Utah on the other. One's on ABC, one's on Fox. Uh, of course, Ole Miss-Alabama on CBS. Uh, but you got a bunch of other stuff going on at that same time, right? BYU-Kansas could be interesting. Maryland, Michigan State. I expect maybe Tua to throw all day on the Michigan State defense. Um, Miami and Temple, okay. Like, that's an interesting road trip. We'll see. Uh, UTSA and Tennessee is in the three o'clock time slot on SEC Network. Uh, if you want to see it, just a disaster of a football game, Oklahoma State and Iowa State's on FS1. And so, okay. I uh, don't know what to make of that one, <laughs> but it is what it is. Um, yeah, just a, a lot of good football going on on Saturday. Now we move into the evening slate. Uh, Saturday night, 6.30 p.m. Central Time. We have got Ohio State and Notre Dame. Yes, monster, monster matchup. Going to be a lot of people watching that one. Oregon State, Washington State is at 6 p.m. Central on Fox. That's going to be a good game, even if it's not two big brands. It's the two leftover teams in the Pac-12. So something to pay attention to on that uh, then, of course, on CBS, late night, you got Iowa at Penn State, and you've got Texas at Baylor on ABC, uh, but you got other good ones as well going on. Arkansas LSU is on ESPN. Uh, Arkansas got beat by BYU last week, and LSU looked awesome against Mississippi State. Now, how much of that was State and how much of that was, uh, was LSU? We'll see. Memphis at Missouri. Uh, breaking news is that Brady Cook is questionable for that game, Missouri's quarterback. So we'll see what happens if, uh, if they got to run out Sam Horn or Jake Garcia on that one. Um, UCF and Kansas State is on FS1 at 7 p.m. And we've also got uh, Mississippi State at South Carolina. 
That one's going to be on SEC Network. Uh, this one would have been a bigger one earlier. North Carolina Pitt. But Pitt has not held up their end of the bargain. So it is what it is. Cal is a 21 or 22 point underdog at Washington. Washington has looked unreal lately. They're on ESPN. But I think like Justin Wilcox does a pretty good job against Washington. He's he's always seemed to cover that number against them. Obviously, new coaching staff at Washington, Kalen DeBoer and company. Um, but yes, that's going to be fun. And then USC, I mean, they are just going to make a mockery of Arizona State on Fox at 9.30 p.m. Central Time. So those are your games for the TV viewing guide for week number four. Not too shabby. All right, I've got a couple more things that we're going to hit here. The most unlikely wins from week three in college football. I try to do this every week. Obviously, didn't get to do it last week. But the most unlikely wins. Uh, Wake Forest, 27-24 over Old Dominion. They had a 38.7% postgame win expectancy in that game. Now, Old Dominion had two uh, defensive touchdowns over 70 yards, all that. feel like this should have been more of a 50-50 spot. But Wake, I mean, they shot themselves in the foot so many times early. It's a, it's a miracle that they were able to win the ballgame. Uh, next up, you got Ohio. A 10-7 to win over Iowa State. They had a 16.7% postgame win expectancy. So taking all of the stats that you had in that game, uh, they would have only won the game 16.7% of the time. The next one, Eastern Michigan, a 19-17 win over UMass. 13.6% uh, postgame win expectancy. That's the way it goes. This one might surprise some of you. If you didn't watch the game, you just, you know, surf box scores and all that. Colorado, 43-35 to 35 win in double overtime over Colorado State. We talked about the TV ratings, all that good stuff. 4.8% postgame win expectancy. Their, their lines are not good. Defensive, offensive, et cetera. And yet they still find ways to win ballgames. Very interesting. And then uh, let's see. Next up, the last one that we'll talk about for this week, and that is BYU, a 38-31 to win at Arkansas. They were outgained by like 140 yards, uh, but Arkansas turnovers, double the penalties, all that good stuff. Uh, BYU, 4.2% postgame win expectancy in a touchdown win at Fayetteville. Uh, now BYU gets to deal with Kansas. That's the way it goes. That is the way that it goes. All right, let's jump into this. Georgia State heads to Coastal Carolina on Friday night, and we'll go on and pull up the stats here. It's uh, 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Oh, sorry, it's Thursday night. 6.30 p.m. Central Time on ESPN. And Coastal Carolina is a six-and-a-half-point favorite in this one right now. Okay, my power ratings up at the top have Coastal Carolina favored by one-and-a-half points. The raw stats from this season have Georgia State favored by 1.13 points. You look at this, there is a world where uh, Co Coastal Carolina, who is pretty good at throwing the football, you know, Tim Beck, the way that he likes to play games, um, they have an advantage throwing the football. At Georgia State is number 101 in PPA per pass. Uh, Coastal Carolina is number 45 on offense. Uh, Coastal is number 38 in passing success rate. Georgia State's defense is number 74 in pass success rate allowed. So... Yeah, there's a lot going on there. Uh, passing explosiveness, Georgia State's not good on that. However, trying to run the ball, uh, Georgia State pretty good in run defense, and that's the way it goes. Georgia State did give up a ton of points uh, to, I eh, forget the FCS team that they played to begin the season, but regardless, a bunch of passing. They gave up like 400 passing yards in that first one. I think it's kind of skewing the numbers a bit, but either way. Remember, we've only got three weeks of data here, so we're, we're just going through this. Um, as far as... The Georgia State offense, you can see it on your screen here, number 15 PPA per pass. Well, Coastal, pretty good at defending the pass, number 19 PPA per pass. Uh, Georgia State, number 34 in passing success rate. Uh, Coastal, number 53 in pass success allowed. Now, where it gets tricky, Georgia State, I feel like their running numbers should be better than this, but obviously we'll see. We will see. Uh, they're number 55 in PPA per rush. They are, or excuse me, Coastal Carolina is number 80 in PPA per rush allowed. So, something to pay attention to there. However, rushing success, Georgia State, terrible, terrible, terrible. 
uh, number 114. Coastal is number 105 in rush success allowed. Uh, Georgia State, number seven in rushing explosiveness, all that good stuff. I This feels like a game that should be closer, so I don't know why Coastal is favored by six and a half. I don't know if this is preseason priors. I don't know what this is, but I I think there's a shot that Georgia State could win this thing outright. I think they can create some explosive plays against this Coastal Carolina defense. So, yeah. I'm going to I'm going to stick with that. I'm going to take Georgia State plus the six and a half here and uh and we'll see what happens with it. We'll see what happens. So Georgia State plus six and a half on that one. Uh next on the board, we're going to cover one more game that we didn't talk about on the Bet US show, and that would be Wisconsin going to Purdue. And this one, this one's on Friday night. Uh Wisconsin, 6 p.m. On FS1, by the way, 6 p.m. Central Time on FS1. And let's pull up the stats for you so you can see what we're looking at. Uh, I've got Wisconsin power rated as 12 and a half points better than Purdue. I've got Wisconsin by 15.61 if you look at just raw numbers thus far this season. Uh, these two offenses are not off, just teams. These two teams, number 12 and number 14 in plays per game. So pace of the game could certainly lean towards Wisconsin being able to cover six points here because Wisconsin is a six point favorite. This is, this is interesting. Very interesting to me um, because all of my, there is a huge advantage for Wisconsin in this game. Um, And it's when Wisconsin is on offense, like I think that they're just a better offensive team. If you look at offensive success rate, et cetera, uh, Wisconsin's defense has not been great. I mean, they got outgained by Georgia Southern, had to have five interceptions, but how much of that is the fact that they didn't care about the fact that it was Georgia Southern, right? So, um, I look at this. Net points per drive matters to me. Number 61 for Wisconsin, number 94 for Purdue. Uh, strength of schedule obviously favors Purdue right now, but strength of record favors Wisconsin. So, yeah, I'm. They haven't figured out the passing game yet. The Badgers haven't, but I think they can run the ball well enough against this Purdue defense. Now, you look at this. Part of this is the fact that only teams have only run the ball like forty-one percent of the time against Purdue, and that's because they can absolutely throw it on them. I think Wisconsin has got the dudes up front to be able to kind of lean on that defensive line. Uh, Although, you look at offensive line yards and stuff rate, and Purdue pretty good on defense. Number 17 in offensive line yards allowed, number 10 in stuff rate. Um, But Wisconsin's offensive line, number 23 in offensive line yards, number 8 in stuff rate allowed. So that's going to be the matchup to watch is how can Wisconsin do running the football against Purdue's defense. And I think they're going to have success. I think they're going to be fine. You look at the other things, turnover margin, Wisconsin's number 47, uh, Purdue is number 60. You look at penalties per game, and you've got, uh, let's see. Yeah, you've got Wisconsin at number 40, and you've got Purdue at number 103. So there's a big difference between those two. I, I tend to believe that Wisconsin is just a significantly better team Although Ryan Walters did have massive success against Wisconsin last year when he was at Illinois. I'm going to take Wisconsin, minus the six. So I've got one dog and one favorite for the Thursday and Friday games that we discussed today. With that said, let's go on and get out of here. Of course, buymeacoffee.com slash winning cures. Follow me on Telegram, Gary WCE. Follow me on um, Instagram and TikTok. Still not there with Twitter, but... I'm putting in appeals all the time. We'll see what happens. Uh, they they tagged me wrong. Twitter, you got it wrong, or X, or whatever you're called now. Uh, but regardless, hopefully I'll be back over on that platform soon. Uh, make sure and check out the BetUS College Football Show. That's right. Knock that bad boy out. Uh, link is in the description for that. I think we got all of our stuff. Three Dog Thursday is going to be on Thursday. Uh, TJ is going to have somebody in. We'll see who it is. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, but with that said, let's step out of this bad boy. Uh, Take care of yourself. Take care of each other. God bless college football. And I hope all of your tickets cash this week. 
Thanks for listening to Winning Cures Everything. Make sure and follow me on Twitter, at GaryWCE. If you want to toss in a question, you can email me, Gary, at winningcureseverything.com. Make sure and hit that subscribe button, and we'll see you next time.